do I really have to say this? But the fact is, Kubernetes is the backbone of modern cloud infrastructure, and every new release brings changes that impact how developers and operators run their clusters. The 1.34 release is out and it continues that tradition of introducing key enhancements around security, policy, and hardware support. To help us break down what's new and why it matters, I'm joined by Vyom Yadav, Kubernetes release lead for this cycle. Vyom, thanks for being here. Hey, hey Swapnal. Nice to be on the show and glad to be talking about Kubernetes v1.34. Let's talk about some of the major changes, updates, enhancements introduced with 1.34 release. I have a couple of my favorite enhancements. Uh, one of them is actually projected Kubernetes service account tokens. I think that's just a great feature for um, having pod identity based image pool secrets, which are ephemeral in nature. So I think that's a really amazing cap talking in terms of security and how it helps multi-tenant environments. It basically allows you to merge what's already there in credential provider, which is at a node level ephemeral tokens with image pool secrets, which are namespace based, but they are static secrets. So it combines both of them. So you have now namespaced pod identity based ephemeral secrets, which is a really great feature in my opinion for multi-tenant environments and isolating them even more. I think V1.34 is a very well-balanced release. It has things in security, it has things in performance, it has things in making the life of cluster operators easier. It has things in supporting better AI workloads and moving towards improving features for modern applications. So it's a very well-rounded release. And this release cycle consists of 58 enhancements and 23 of them are going stable, 22 are going beta and 13 are in the alpha stage. So very well-rounded release cycle. One change that stands out is pod specific service accounts token. How does that improve the security model for image pools in Kubernetes clusters? Yes, so right now what is there in Kubernetes for configuring pulling images from private registries. Either you have image pull secrets, which are basically hard-coded secrets in your cluster that you manually have to take care of on a namespace level that you can use to pull um, images from private registries, or you have on the ephemeral side, credential provider. Now credential provider is based on the node level. So all the pods that are scheduled onto that node would have access to that particular registry. Now, this is not really great for multi-tenant environments where there can be multiple pods from different tenants on the same node. So this gap actually allows for better isolation using uh, something called as adding an audience or token attributes to the credential provider config, which allows you to bind the service account token, use the service account token that is bounded to a pod, use the pod's identity as um, a way to fetch particular images from a particular registry. And you can actually have roles using RBAC, which allows you to not uh, allow other pods to fetch a particular kind of image from a private registry, even if the credential provider for there is on that particular node. So it combines both namespace based thing that you get from image pool secrets, so namespace isolation, and the ephemeral tokens that you get from credential provider to merge them into one and provide better isolation so that there is no over provisioning of, no, not over sharing of secrets. So secrets just remain with the pods they are meant to be. Dynamic resource allocation or DRA is now GA. What kind of advanced hardware workloads like AI accelerator or custom devices does this make easier to support? Right, yes, DRA is in GA and that's one of the major enhancements in this release. DRA itself is actually opaque to the type of devices that are going to be used in Kubernetes, but it has been built with keeping the different use cases in mind. For example, DRA actually allows for better device sharing. Um, a good example of that is having GPUs in which there is time sharing. So you can have actually two pods or two containers use the same GPU and they can have time-based sharing on that GPU. 
It also allows for multi-process support. Now, this is not inside Kubernetes. This is something that would be implemented in the driver. But because there is driver uh, device sharing, you can actually have the implementation in the driver that allows for use cases like these, where you have flexible device sharing, you have flexible device filtering. So this gap also allows you to filter devices or filter GPUs, feed programmable aggregates, or uh, whatever kind of device you have based on a very specific condition that wasn't uh, in the previous device plugin API. So this gap is very opaque to the devices, but at the same time, it includes the features that are required for supporting particular use cases. So it supports use case that any device driver can implement, but at the same time being opaque to them. If I'm not wrong, another new feature is mutating admission policies. How do mutating admission policies simplify policy enforcement as compared to legacy admission webhooks? Mutation, mutating admission policy is a great feature. What it allows you that combined with validating admission policy and non-mutating admission policy, you have a lot of use cases for admission webhooks covered in Kubernetes itself. So you don't need to have any external admission webhook if your use cases are being met, or you don't need to even have any external admission controller like Kiverno or OPA and use those because if you're using an external admission controller, with that comes the inherent challenges of scaling that admission controller, of rolling that back, rolling that out. And all these challenges also are not really great for cluster administrators because you now have one more application to take care of. Alongside this, there's also the latency issue with webhooks. Webhooks, if you have configured them in your cluster, they would introduce some latency in there. Now it might be very minimum if it's in the internal network, but it can be higher if the actual admission webhook is running somewhere else, the code for that is running somewhere else. Another problem with admission webhooks is that you actually, if the admission webhook is not reachable, you have the option of allowing every request or denying every request. Now, this is a problem that isn't there with mutating or admission uh, policies because they are inbuilt into Kubernetes and there won't be a case when these aren't reachable. So overall, if the use cases of cluster administrators can be met by mutating and validating admission policies, these are great features to use. Of course, other agents have, or the other policy engines have other types of policies as well. So if mutating an admission suits your needs, then that's the one that you should go for. There is also the new snapshotable API server cache. What practical benefits will operators of large or high traffic clusters actually see from this? So before talking about this particular cap, I would like to give you some historical context. This is not actually a single cap that improves the performance of the API server and uh, how API server interacts with etcd. There's actually a trifecta of caps that do that. Now, this particular cap snapshotable API server cache is the kind of final key missing piece in that trifecta that was that is going beta in this release. But prior to that, there were two other caps, which was consistent reads from cache, uh, which was, I believe, uh, it's, it's going stable in this particular release cycle, but it went to beta in B1.31. So this particular cap, actually the results it had was 30% reduction in API server uh, CPU usage and 25% reduction in etcd CPU usage. Now, what this cap did was that it allowed for filtered list responses, which previously weren't there because the requests were being directly routed to etcd. Now, there was another cap in this trifecta, which is the second one, which is actually streaming the list responses. So instead of buffering them in memory, you stream them so that there is low pressure on the API server. And this is the final cap in that trifecta, the major one, uh, the major missing piece, which is snapshotable AI server cache, so API server cache. So what this allows for is actually any historical list that is being fetched from the API server would now not go to etcd, but instead be served from the watch cache of the API server. So now virtually every request can be served from the API server without fetching data directly from etcd for that particular request. So I think all these three caps combined 
really boost the performance of API server and how API server interacts with etcd. And yeah, this trifecta uh, going with this particular cap going beta in this cycle kind of marks a monumental milestone for API machinery and etcd folks. So kudos to them for this. If I ask you, what was the most challenging feature to land in this release and how did the community work through it? Well, there are always caps that are just merged uh, just before the code freeze. So there are a lot of caps whose code is merged right before the code freeze. KML was actually one of them. Uh, KML is a really neat feature in Kubernetes, um, although there can be a few um, opinions on that that are not that nice. But it was one of the caps that was just merged before the code freeze. And another challenging aspect that this release had was with Confirmance tests. Now, DRA going JA, this is a really major announcement. And uh, work group uh, device management folks have really put in a lot of effort to get this to this level. But DRA is missing confirmance tests in this particular release, which would be added to a patch release. Now, this doesn't mean that DRA is not tested well enough or it's not ready for GA. It very well is. Uh, it has got all the coverage in end-to-end -end tests. But that was a particularly challenging thing because uh, it required pooling resources from throughout the project, the leads, the people, a few folks from steering to come and chime in that discussion, uh, which was ultimately something that we are going to improve in the future releases. So every release has its challenges, but I think it's um, it goes very well with the theme actually that it's the will of you know, people involved in the community that make it work. So there are challenges, but we work around them. You have to move fast, but you also have to remain reliable and stable. How do you balance introducing new features while keeping Kubernetes stable and reliable for enterprises who are already running critical workloads? So the current feature of how any feature progresses in Kubernetes is very well defined. So whenever a new feature is promoted, it goes through alpha, or there are some instances where alpha have been skipped, but those have been acceptable in the community. Those are the exceptions. But every cap goes through alpha, then goes through beta, and then finally the GA stage. So what this allows is, this allows for the cap to be tested well enough by end users, as well as internally in Kubernetes, so that when this gap goes to GA or this feature goes to GA, it is well tested and well known by the community. Every stage has some increments to the gap. For example, when a gap goes beta, it might be enabled by default in the API. There are some caps that are enabled by default when they go beta. So this allows that gap to run in actual production clusters that are in V1.34 to get actual user feedback and work on things, improve uh, features, fix bugs for that particular feature so that when it goes to GA, it is actually stable and there are no major bugs in that particular feature. So this cycle from alpha to beta to GA, this gives Cap a lot of time to absorb, get absorbed in the community as well as be thoroughly tested in Kubernetes. Of course, there are a lot of features in this release, but for developers and operators, What's the one improvement in this release that you think they will feel the most in day-to-day -day use? I think there are a lot of great features for cluster administrators in this cycle. Um, talking about one of the primary features, DRA actually had two implementations. One was the classic DRA, and this is the implementation that is merged going stable in this cycle, which is called structured parameters. Now, DRA, the classic DRA was not very helpful for cluster administrators because that particular cap didn't allow for cluster auto scaling wherever, whereas this particular cap does. So that addresses a very core pain point of folks working with devices, cluster administrators working with devices that is really solved in this release with DRA going GA. And in general, this cap has a lot of features that make it easier for cluster administrator to provision resources in a cluster. For example, you have device classes. Device classes actually allow cluster administrator to kind of tie devices into pools of critical workload devices versus devices that can be used for every workload. 
categorizing GPUs into categories that really makes it easier for cluster administrator to distribute GPUs or devices across the cluster. So there are a lot of pain points for cluster administrators that have been addressed in this release. And because DRA going GA is a very big uh, pass in this release, this is what GRA did for helping cluster administrators. It actually went through two implementation cycles in order to make the lives of cluster administrators easy. Every Kubernetes release had its own theme and logo, which has kind of become a fun tradition in the community. What's the story behind the 1.34 theme and how does it connect with this release and the larger community? The release theme this time, um, it is kind of capturing the essence of what happens while we are releasing a new version of Kubernetes. The release itself is called of wind and will. So the release is based on the fact that every release cycle, we inherit a lot of wins. That is basically the state of our tooling, the documentation we have, or the historical quirks of the project. Now, it's not every day that these winds fill our sails and propel the ship to tear through the ocean. Sometimes these winds kind of destabilize the ship, or sometimes these winds just die down. But an important thing to note here is that it's not the perfect winds that get this ship across the ocean. It's actually the will of the sailors, the contributors that put in a lot of effort to get this ship through the ocean. So this release is kind of dedicated to contributors. This is a release that is powered by the wind around us because wind is required for a ship to move forward, but it is also powered by the will within us. So this release kind of embodies what we have learned from the winds around us and the will that propels us forward. So it's called off wind and will, and I think it really accurately sums up how we work in the Kubernetes community. Kubernetes 1.34 shows how the community continues to evolve the project, is strengthening security, is scaling better, and opening doors to new workloads. Bjorn, thank you so much for walking us through the changes. I really appreciate your time today, and I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you so much. For those watching, if you are building or running on Kubernetes, we would love to hear how these updates are shaping your work. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and stay tuned for more conversations on Kubernetes and Cloudity. Thanks for watching.